Code Fun Podcast Network. This podcast is brought to you by our friends at Linode. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing your enterprise's infrastructure, Linode has the pricing, support, and scale you need to take your project to the next level. Get started on Linode today by going to linode.com slash remote ruby. This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? What's up, y'all? Hey, hey. Good morning. How's it going? Anything good? good? Not too bad. Pretty good week. Got some stuff done on uh, Jumpstart Pro that's been in the hopper for a while. So excited to get that out the door finally. How about you guys? I'm doing doing good. Not nothing crazy going on. Yeah, nothing nothing too exciting here. What kind of Jumpstart Pro stuff you've been working on? Mostly multi tenancy. So it's funny because like people have pretty strong like feelings of what like the word teams means and you know i built that to be like uh basically associate any resources like models and things with that that you want to potentially share with other people so you know every user has their own personal team to keep things private just like you would on github but you might have an organization or something to share things with your teammates or whatever same thing that you see on Heroku and DigitalOcean and pretty much every app. So I had called them teams, but it seems like people are very confused on what that means and they want to like add multi tenancy to that. And so I was like going through all of that, where it's like, I need to either change the name of this or like try and educate people that like it is multi tenancy. Like if you are separating out these resources like on a team level then you are separating them out it doesn't mean they have to be in a separate database or anything like the most performance stuff anyways is usually row level multi-tenancy so you always associate every model with your tenant with whatever you know team id or whatever so i decided that it probably makes more sense to switch it over to like uh, calling it an account because, you know, it's a more generic term that kind of people will understand a bit better, it seems like. And then they could build, if they want groups of users, like teams underneath that, but they'd build that themselves. So unfortunately, that is a feature that, you know, you kind of want out of the gate because it's really hard to add teams or accounts or whatever after the fact. And I had done that from the very beginning in Jumpstart Pro, but to rename them from teams to accounts requires changing like every single file in the entire application. So that's been quite a bit of work to go and and make that update. And then building out sort of the account switching stuff, because like right now you can just choose an account. A good example is like Basecamp. If you go and have multiple accounts in Basecamp, then you can see in the URL that the ID of your account is at the very beginning. And I did an episode on that for GoRails a long time ago. So that's like an option in Jumpstart Pro now. You can do the old style where it just sets a session cookie. And then, you know, whatever that value is, it'll try and load up that account for you. But then I also added support for subdomains and domains to read those choose the account for um, the site then and also ended up using uh, current attributes, which is another feature of Rails that pretty much nobody uses. It seems like it came out and just kind of got ignored. So I figured that might be a good opportunity to use that too. So it's been a lot of a lot of work, but it's almost done. So I'm, I'm glad to have that out the door. Have you guys had to deal with any multi-tenant like things yourself? I have had to deal with almost the exact same situation. CodeFund, we wanted to basically add the idea of an organization. Well, we wanted to add the idea of team. We had organizations, but it was a one-to-one mapping. So we added in teams in the middle. So an organization can basically have it's not teams is like a weird way of wording it. It's more like organization users, but 
we refer to it as teams sometimes. So basically oh, an organization can have organization users, which is just a, a join table and the organization user table has roles on it. And we also use current attributes because Nate really likes it. And that has worked out very, very well for us. Yeah, I'm really pretty happy with it. And like the main reason I reached for it for this was, I, and I, I didn't even know this was the thing until I researched this for that screencast to do the base camp style URLs. But to put like an ID at the very beginning of your URLs, the easiest way is to build like a rack middleware that runs before Rails even gets to it. And then parse that out and then strip it out. So Rails never even really sees that exists. And then in the middleware, I can just use current attributes and say, you know, the current account is now this. And that's pretty helpful. So I was like, man, this is kind of cool. I should also set this up to like, you know, at the beginning of your request, I'll also go and store like the device user in there as well if you need to access it or whatever. Because they have their own you know, helper, current user, or whatever. But it's nice to have it all in the same place at the same time. Yeah, we did originally because I had teams, I had a join table of team members that was like a nice kind of name for it. Now we have accounts and account users as our join table. And then I can see in the future, you know, like having some like grouping lower than that where it's like, a group of account users or something would be like, these are the admins, these are the regular members or whatever, if you needed to group them, like to mention a entire group of people, that might be something to, to add in the future. But another interesting piece is like those invitations, you know, when you're inviting a user who, if they already have an account with that email address, you could just kind of auto accept them and force them into your team automatically. A lot of times you really want that to be like a accept or decline invitation step because that user actually might want to use a different email address for their account or something. So I ended up changing that out too, but that kind of makes it so you have a account invitation model and then an account user model gets created if they accept the invitation but it makes it tough because you can't actually associate anything with that right away because you don't have that account user record. So I think I'm going to go and update that as well so that it'll create it, but in like a, in a pending way where it's kind of hidden, maybe filtered out in the default scope. And then you can associate things to that if you want to assign like a to-do or something to that pending user, you could. But it's kind of an interesting thing. Like the stuff is like, Way more complex than you would think, you know, because when you're using it, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. So we have a similar thing, but I built it slightly differently. If you're an admin in an organization, you can invite other members to your team, essentially. And the way we did that is I basically have a, a stimulus reflex form where you can type in a user's email address and Simulus Reflex will tell you whether or not they're a user. And if they're already a user, you could add them to your team. Because of the way CodeFund works, like needing them to accept it wasn't really a concern. So we just auto add them. And if they're not a user, like Reflex will be like, this isn't a user, you can invite them. Because inviting a user, you have to add a little bit more info for the invitation than just adding them straight to your team. So yeah, so that's what we did. Are you guys using like a device invitable or something like that for invitations? Because that one I found kind of useful. It like skips validations and it will create a user record for you, which is kind of neat because then you like, you know, you, you have a user record you can assign stuff to immediately, even though they haven't accepted it yet. But at the same time, it's like, Obviously, skipping validations and inserting records in there for you. So it's not quite as clean as you might want it. Yeah, we use it, but I have found myself on more than one occasion overwriting like actions in that controller to create those validations, basically. 
Yeah, because you like you want the invitation to run some validations, just not maybe all of them that a regular registration would or whatever. Yeah. It's funny because that's like a trickier process than it appears on the surface. And then you might want to also have other things like a custom little message, you know, when you invite someone like you might want to include that. You might need to add an attribute that gets forwarded along to your mailer and so on. You might want different types of invitations too, but it only kind of has one standard one or whatever. So that whole process ended up being quite a bit more complex than, you know, initially I was like, oh, it'll be easy. We'll just add teams and team members and voila, we'll be done. And now I'm like, man, things are, to do it in a robust robust way is a lot more work than, than you would expect. How was your experience using the current attributes API? Pretty good. I think it's pretty easy to to stuff too much stuff in there. So for example, like, you know, we have a current user, we have a current account. There's the current account user, which is the join table with the roles in it. And I was trying to kind of go through and assign that as well. And I may still go back and do that, but that's a situation where like, the user or the account might be set first. And so in either one of those cases, I kind of have to override the setter and say like, is there a current user and an account? Can we finally go look that record up and assign it? And then I was like doing that and I was like, well, it's kind of duplicating this and I don't necessarily need to go assign it every time. I need to like grab that current account user and just cache it whenever I need it. Otherwise, I'd prefer never to look it up and make that database query. So things like that, you can easily feel like they belong in there. Whereas maybe it's better as just a helper, which is the route I ended up going. So it's like, well, if you ever need to access this, we know the current user, we know the current account, we will grab the account user and and memoize it in a helper instead. And that would be a little bit just more flexible in that way. There were a few times where like something I did in my tests persisted the account across more than one test. And so, but I believe that current, so current attributes will automatically reset on every request in Rails, but it should also do that on every test as well automatically for you. There was something I was doing that was causing that to break or something. And it was probably just a stupid mistake on my end. I got it fixed, but I don't really remember what the situation was. And I'm, and I remember at the time wondering, like, is this really resetting be- between my tests? So, for the most part, it's very straightforward. The only downside is that it might give you the tendency to reach for a current account more often than you should. It's fine in your like controllers and and your usual usage of where you would probably use current user, like the device helper. But if you're like, you know, writing a background job, don't use current account, like pass in the account and then, you know, keep track of that because you don't want to worry about these global variables being always set correctly. You kind of have to keep track of that and remind yourself when to use it properly. So. It, it seems like a sharp tool that can be easily kind of abused and cut yourself with it. Yeah, one of the examples in the API docs is like once you set like current.user, they have a belongs to in a model and they default to like current.user. And I'm just, I don't know, that scares me. I know it's the sharp tool thing, but I can see myself like cutting myself very bad on that. Like, yeah. You can very easily, you know, write something like that that's not going to function the same way in a background job, you know, and that's not a good setup. You would have to make sure your background jobs, you know, get passed in the user and then assign current user for the duration of the job or something. And, you know, you just kind of want to avoid that as much as you can. And... It is a, it starts to blur the lines. So 
I can see why using that might not be a, a great option for a, a lot of cases. So uh, there's not a lot of guidance on, you know, that when to use it and when not to use it. It's just kind of like, here's a tool here. It's available. You can shoot yourself in the foot with it if you'd like. And that's probably maybe a good reason why more people aren't adopting it. It is not, it's not super safe to use in a lot of cases. What we do is we have a before action in our application controller and it grabs the current organization from session. So we save that in the session and that way we don't have to keep doing lookups. Um, and we don't, we don't use it a lot. Like really the only thing we use it for, I think Nate just added one more thing, but we just do current dot organization in a couple of places. And I never, along with your background job thing, I never really thought about it until you said it, but my opinion of background jobs is that everything you want to use in a background job, you should pass into it. And I, I want it to be... is. It's impotent, <laughs> whatever that mm-hmm. word is. Idempotent, whatever. I everything in my background job, other than you know, like relationships and stuff. I I, I think you should pass in. Yeah, I agree completely with that. the The only like problem is, you know, if you reference current dot account or organization or whatever in in a method in your model, and you pass in the account into your background job, but don't assign it to current account, then your model is just going to find a nil instead. And that would be weird. So it ends up being kind of a strange thing where you're like, depending on this variable to be set correctly, but you have no idea when it's being set and when it's being cleared and anything. So yeah, I, I would much prefer, like if you're building a background job, Pass in the account explicitly, but then also, you know, also like write your code there to make sure that like it forwards the account around and passes it in as arguments into whatever methods it needs to use. Just because then that way, either that or I guess you could set current account at the very beginning of your background job and just be like kind of religious about doing that. Maybe you build that into like, I don't know, some little method you call from perform automatically or something. But, you know, it, it, is, it does seem like something you can easily mess up. That's for sure. And that was like a, a good example of this is like writing these tests. You know, you can set up one nice shortcut is you can just throw in current account to whatever account you want and write a test for that case. And you don't have to worry about doing any weird setup of like, Oh, we got to like set this session cookie in our integration test, which isn't easy to do anymore. And we can just like set current account, run our test and we're good to go. Like we're on the right one or whatever. That can be kind of helpful. And that was one of those things that I was like trying to test in this building this functionality out was like, we have four different mechanisms to set the current account. So you can do it by session cookie you can do it by the path in the middleware subdomain or like the domain itself. And I needed to write tests that would actually like test each one of those and make sure it, it did that correctly. So I actually stubbed out like the method saying these are the available options to set your current account. And at each test, it was like, well, this one only supports domains. So we'll look at the domain and make sure a current account got set correctly or, or was rendered onto the page correctly. And then each other test would change that and force it into, we can only support subdomains for this test. And that was kind of nice. Like that worked out nice and reliably. But as I was like getting to that point of like, it is way trickier, it seems, than doing kind of the the more traditional like, We'll just have a helper that we use and pass in the account into our methods and whatnot. Yeah, we do not use current attributes in the model. We only use current attributes in helpers, views, and controllers. That seems like probably the safest thing you could possibly do. That way it works just like a helper or like a, you know, a method and application controller that you expose as a helper. 
then you have it available in all the in the request itself. It's probably the thing that people get confused about too in, in Rails. It's like the request goes through your controllers, your actions, and your views and your helpers, and then it's done. But your models are like a separate thing that are like, we represent something in the database. We could be called at any time in a background job, in a request, in a rake task, cron job, who knows what. And they don't have a current thing going on quite the same way. And it's probably good not to use any of the current attribute stuff in those, in those models. Yeah, I, I agree. As you've been talking about this, I've been like just realizing how much of Nate's philosophies have been rubbing off on me. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. yeah. I, you're, you're picking up some, some good techniques from very good developer. So that is probably going to save you a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble as you, as you would go normally. What else, what else have you guys been working on or looking at? Uh, this past week? I saw, I wanted to mention this. I forgot to mention this before we started the show. Last week we talked about Hanami API. Did you see the article they put out this week about running it on Lambda? Uh, No, but that's exciting. Yeah, it's really cool. So I'm not going to, I can't spend a lot of time on it because I don't know much about Lambda, but they wrote an article and it's pretty cool. So the one thing like that I'll mention is I say rack on AWS Lambda and it talks about how since it's not a Ruby server, it's just a generic server, they had to write like some glue to make like AWS and a rack compatible framework work. But it's pretty cool because it's only like, I mean, it's not very many lines of code to fire it up. And then you just literally run like a regular old Hanami API app. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, I, I remember when Taylor talked about, uh, you know, making Laravel compatible with Lambda and everything. And he was like, well, it's it's kind of good for me because I own the framework and I can just go make internal changes to support it. I was right. like, yeah, I wish that... It, I mean, if he's able to do that for Laravel, if they're able to do that for Hanami, it'd be really cool to have that possible in in Rails or whatever. And I know Ruby on Jets is like, I I can't really tell, but it's like a fork of some of the internals of Rails or something to be able to support it. Because I know it's like generally a Rails app, but I don't really know a whole lot. Yeah, it's not like true backwards compatible Rails. Yeah. Well, I think because of the way Lambda works being functions and just taking URL and saying, go call this, you know, it's kind of like, let's rip out the routing layer and replace it with a thing that just sets up lambdas and has those calls your like your controller action directly almost. So my guess is like, all that would have to be kind of ripped apart in order to, you know, make it compatible. But I've never really looked into it too deeply either, but that's yeah. pretty exciting. It's always been a thing high on my list. I mean, we had a talk at Southeast Ruby last year on Jets, but... Yeah, uh, it was fun. It like, really got me hyped about it because I was like... Yeah, same. Uh, this is like the the thing that, you know, in theory, it's always like much more complex than the actual theory of it. But you're like, in theory, I can deploy my app to Lambda and just never worry about servers or scaling or literally anything. It just like takes care of it all for me. Which is kind of the dream, right? Yeah, there's Fathom Analytics is built on Laravel and they use Vapor and they're one of the co-founders who's actually the one like implementing Vapor released a course on it. And and Vapor is, if you don't know, the Laravel software as a service that'll let you run Laravel on AWS Lambda. But they talk about how like they don't even think about scaling anymore. And like before they did that, they had a lot of trouble with like handling load at certain times. And since they've done it, they just kind of like wipe their hands and it just works, which is really cool because it's just a layer of a lap put on Lambda. Oh man, that is cool. Cause building an analytics tool, I'm sure that like 
you know, scaling and, and all of that is your primary concern, I would guess. Yeah. And that probably ebbs and flows so much. Yeah. You, you don't, gonna, you can't know when you're going to have peak times. No. Yeah. Cause it's like, well, we might get a new customer that like has a heavy traffic site and all of a sudden our baseline is now twice what it was before or something, which would be crazy. So yeah, that it seems like a very, very good place to, unless you were really good at scaling stuff, you know, being able to just throw it all at Lambda, you may pay a little more for it or whatever. I don't, I don't know how the costs will work out, but you know, that is a pretty sweet, deal to be able to maybe throw a few more bucks at it and never have to worry about a DevOps person or whatever, hiring them like right out of the box, you know, when you start your business. That's cool. (laughs) Lambda.hatchbox.io. I wish. Yeah. I don't know. It's one of those things that seems, it seems like when I was talking to Tung at Southeast Ruby, like, the uh, some of the issues are getting fixed with the very slow spin up times to f- deal with databases and things. So if you want like a traditional Postgres server, it was not very good to be able to use Lambda because it was like it would take a, a minute or two to spin up a a thing that would connect with it, and you can try and keep stuff warm and like send fake requests just to make sure that it doesn't shut it down or something, but. Yeah, if it needs to scale up, then it was like pretty slow because it wouldn't be able to keep up with launching new handlers or something. But it seems like AWS has been working on improving that quite a bit. And they officially support Ruby now, which was not a thing in the past either. It was like, what was it? You could install Ruby and then create a Node app that would forward to Ruby and spin that up. And now it's like, okay, this is kind of nonsense that you have to do that. But luckily that is officially supported now. That made me so sad. The words that you just said in that succession. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I I don't know what it takes for them to support a language, but it's pretty funny that people were like, oh, we still badly want to use Ruby. So I guess we'll build a little node server that, is officially supported and just forward along. It was pretty great. Earlier you were, I, I thought about this, you were talking about writing tests for Jumpstart. Do you use like integration slash system tests? Yeah, we use a lot of, I try and do like a lot of, avoid system tests pretty much as, as much as I can. And then then write integration tests for whatever, Kind of a lot of the stuff is integration tests and then I'll try and use, you know, some some model tests for basic things like, you know, you know like the core of Jumpstart's interesting because it's such a bare bones app. It's like the infrastructure you need, like payments and things. So the PageM has all the like payments testing and whatever, but we have some that's like, do we make sure we implemented our payments controllers and all of that stuff, right? The underlying payment stuff is like unit tests inside the page M, but then we have integration tests for the higher level payments things and, you know, making sure that if you click cancel, then it says your subscription will cancel in three weeks or whatever, that sort of stuff. And then we have less model tests just because we don't have business logic, like it's a template, you know, there's not a lot of business logic to test, but there are some things like You know, if you have subdomains enabled, we need to have some sort of reserve subdomain so someone can't register on your site and be like, I think my subdomain is going to be a help dot, you know, example.com. And then I can just like pretend that I'm the, the help or whatever for that service. So, you know, we have some minimal stuff for, for those things that are, that's needed wherever, but. I think for the most part, it's integration tests that are not, or integration or whatever, controller tests, not system tests. The only reason I ask, have you ever heard of Bright? It's a headless Chrome driver for Capybara. It is in, It is a replacement for Selenium. Okay. And Selenium is 
we're not we're not on good terms honestly you know i i don't we're not we're not cool i'm not sitting down to have a drink with selenium anytime soon <laughs> i found cuprite which is basically a replacement for it and i swapped them out saw some performance enhancements haven't seen any of the wackiness i was seeing from selenium so that was something you guys maybe should check out the one thing i found interesting that is probably worth mentioning is that you can remove the web drivers gem from your gem file if you replace it with Cuprite, but you can't delete Selenium web driver because if you do, Rails will error. Hmm. Because something in Rails, there's some stuff around testing in Rails that specifically requires the Selenium web driver gem, even if you're not going to use it. Oh, it's kind of like some reference to it that doesn't really need to be there or should be more modular. Hmm. Yeah. I'll have to check that out though. That sounds pretty cool. I'll have to have a make sure we add that as a link in the show notes. But yeah, I've I think we've all probably dealt with some of the annoyances with using selenium. And if that works and improves it, then that's an easy switch, I would say. Yeah. Nate's not very bullish on testing in general, but that's another topic for another day. We did At one point, we had a situation with our ads where someone changed something and they thought they were actually changing something else, but they changed the wrong thing. And then we deployed and then there were other issues on top of it. And there's just a big, massive cluster dookie. And one of the... We had to write a postmortem and everything. And one of our... The ways we decided that we were going to combat this type of behavior in the future was to write system tests for our ads. So... Basically, the system tests will, for each of the ad templates, it will spin it up in a server and check that it looks all right. But when I wrote the system tests, I, it's, it's just a, it's a giant disaster, really. Like it is something you do not want to go change. And I, I just, it's so, it took me a long time to write them and, um, it's just gross, but we've had issues with them on CI and Cuprite seems to have rectified a lot of them. Oh, that's really cool to hear. Yeah, I've, man, um, doing a lot of, I think the system tests we do have are like the ones that will run like the Stripe JavaScript and make sure that it creates a payment method ID and submits that and whatever. And yeah, those those are pretty nasty because that like iframe for the credit card number gets tricky to interact with Capybara. And then there's something that with the new SEA modals, I had to throw in like a wait 10 seconds, like sleep for 10 seconds and, and wait for that modal to, to load. Cause it's like the modal loads with Ajax or something, but then also the content of the modal loads separately as an Ajax request. So you can't even confirm that like the modal loaded correctly. And then you have to go as well even further and, you know, wait again to make sure the content's available before you click the button. And those were like really annoying to debug and try and deal with because it was like the thing that I ended up doing was like, I guess I'll just do this in a Chrome, you know, not a headless test for as long as I need to and then watch it and poke around and whatever. And then eventually... I'll switch to headless and hope it works. But yeah, it's a a lot of a fingers crossed feeling at that point. Yeah, I put some system tests in at work when we were making the SCA changes and they ran fine on my computer. Like, you know, like we had to do within frame and do this obscure string to get it to find the stripe frame. But then like my coworker would run it and fill in 424242 or whatever was either not finishing before it went to the next thing or it was like just blowing up and like doubling fours and doubling twos. And he had to like, I can't remember what he did, but I want to say he had to like make a method call for each number in the credit card to get it to fill in the correct order. (laughs) That is, that is pretty funny. Yeah. There was, I think some of my first attempts were doing lots of stuff like that. Or I would like throw a buy bug in the middle of the test and then like try and run the code to type a character into the field 
myself <laughs> like in the buy bug yeah. and see what happens. Yeah. Lots of that nonsense. Yeah. We, and we too had trouble getting it to stand up on CI. So right now it's only run locally and they're actually like, you have to explicitly tell our spec to run. I'm like, I have it set as an instance or a environment variable. I actually, mm-hmm. on my side stuff, I've been trying to do more system tests than unit testing and I've been pretty happy with it, but oh yeah, it's smaller projects. and Yeah. Cause it's, it's one of those that like, in theory, your system tests are like the only thing you really need because it kind of tests everything end to end, which is like going to give you the most confidence that your code's going to work, which is fantastic, right? Like there's little things like, oh man, what was it that somebody the other day was like, had an issue with Jumpstart and their JavaScript was broken. So they would like switch accounts, but it was sending a get request instead of a patch request or whatever. And like that little stuff makes a big difference, but you're never going to catch that in your integration tests, your unit tests or anything like that. Like the only way you catch some of those things is in a real browser, which is your only answer is system tests. So like I, I love the idea of system tests, you know, I just wish they were more reliable or easy to, to write, you know, did you guys ever use that one tool? I don't remember the name of it, but it would like, it was like a Chrome extension or something that you would go and load a page and click on things. And it would record that into, you know, whatever you would copy and paste as your test later on. So it record your actual actions. I was thinking about that gym or that package the other day and I couldn't remember the name of it. It was like, I remember it coming out like years ago. Yeah. It's Andrew, pretty old. Andrew literally just posted something in the chat like seconds ago. Uh, that does that. Heaven's door. Yeah. Andrew, what you want to tell us more about this? Yeah. I haven't really used it because there's a, it doesn't really work with stimulus reflex because it, in, what it is is a a Rails engine that when you load up a page, you can click a little icon in the top right corner of the browser and do some actions, and then it will like copy the capybar like basically test code for you. But what it does under the hood is it inserts stuff into the onto the page outside of like after everything in Rails is run. And a stimulus reflex will wipe it out if you're not careful because when stimulus reflex like replaces the, like the HTML and the DOM with the new HTML, it's not going to know that that was supposed to be there and it'll, it'll wipe it out. So you got to be careful with things like that. But in general, it's pretty cool. It's a, it did work very well when I did try it. That's pretty cool. But yeah, it makes sense that it's like uh, it's going to generate like a rough outline of your test rather than like the actual test that you really want to run. Because there's a lot of that too that's like you really want to test like I visit this page then at some point in the next 15 seconds does this content load if it's like being dynamically published from you know web sockets or an Ajax request or whatever and that's night. Like, not as easy probably to build a thing in your browser. Is this like a, well, I guess it looks like it inserts JavaScript into the page uh, yes. like somewhere automatically for you. Maybe yeah. like the, was it the Rack Mini Profiler does that where it inserts mm-hmm. that little JavaScript thing at the in the corner? Yeah, and... Stimulus Reflex will wipe that out too. If you're in development and you're running Rack Mini Profiler and you don't do anything to actually try to keep it there, out of the box when Reflex runs, it will re- that won't be there anymore because it's like, hey man, like that wasn't uh, that wasn't supposed to be there. Where did that even come from? Like we're not gonna put it back in there because <laughs> like, it has no it has no concept of it. Uh, makes sense. Yeah, it's like because it's kind of injected in a middleware or whatever, it's like not a not a thing it's aware of when it goes to replace things. That makes a lot of sense. And you, can, of- you can do something to keep it there, but 
I don't care enough to do that. So, Did you guys ever fix your authenticity token thing the other day? Uh, quote unquote fix, yes. It's actually really funny. In Rails, you can enable development caching. And if anyone ever goes to code funds repo and looks at the readme and we have instructions on how to get the app running locally which is actually going to be working a lot better now because nate's rewriting all the seeding and on in the instructions it specifically says that caching is like basically required to run like development caching is basically required to run because if not the app might not work correctly and nate had somehow turned off development caching and the app was not working correctly. <laughs> oh, wow. That's pretty funny. It, I guess it makes sense too, though, that like if you're using in, caching in production, it's probably not a bad idea to use caching as much as possible in development just to make sure it mimics production. But if that's something you forget about, then it's real easy to, to run into that issue. That's funny. Yeah, but... I mentioned this to you in Slack the other day, and I think you're right. I think it's because we're using Devise Masquerade. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that actually is the problem. That's funny. I didn't, yeah, I wasn't sure because I I happened to be yesterday, what was I doing? I, I was doing something in an admin area in development, and it reminded me that the Devise Masquerade gem does have, a weird thing where I, I, I guess it's not totally weird, but in order to log in as another user, they generate a cache key that expires in like a minute. And then they go to retrieve that when you actually click the login link. So for example, you might click on the user in the admin and sit on that page for 15 minutes or something. Well, they don't want to like really leak this key ever. So there's an expiration on it. And I think I had a tab open or something where the key had expired and I clicked to log in and it, it like masqueraded as myself or something, which was kind of funny because I'm like now logged in twice as myself. And that reminded me that I had an issue with the gem before because caching was off in development. And I don't remember that ever being like a requirement but it, it caused an issue and then I actually went and refactored the gem, I don't know, like a month ago or something. And I forgot about doing this where it uses global IDs instead in my refactoring so that we don't need to depend on the Rails cache at all. We can use global IDs with an expiration built in instead. So then there's like no dependency on caching, which in theory, is more how this should work anyways. Yeah, and it's funny because there's a guy that's very active in the Simulus Reflex community. His name is Pete. When you mentioned that it could be Devise Masquerade, I went and looked at the gem, and funny enough, like a month or two ago, Pete had opened a PR on that gem to add in the docs that you need to be running caching in development or it won't really work. Like your app will start screwing around. So. I think it was his his PR that I stumbled upon that like explained basically why it wasn't working for my app at the time. And I was like, wait a minute. This seems like a totally... like I get that we need to make this uh, note here for how it currently works, but why is it working like this at all? Because it seemed like a totally unnecessary dependency to me and because global IDs are so... They're maybe not as backwards compatible because I forget when they got introduced, but it was like Rails 4.2 or something. So they're like, you know, they've been around for a while and all of your active storage and action text and everything else depends on that behind the scenes. And I was like, yeah, why, why do we need caching to be enabled? And isn't that going to make it so that it just confuses everyone who ever wants to test this in development? Because it's like, uh, caching's disabled by default. So like, it's just not going to work in development when you test this feature out for the first time. So it seems strange to me. And then, yeah, that, it was funny that like that happened to randomly come up yesterday because I was like, 
getting every single time I tried to log in, it would give me an invalid authenticity token error. And there may have been some like leftover thing from a previous masquerade in the, in the cookies or something. But I was like racking my brain to try and figure out why I wasn't able to even log in. And then I, I ran spring stop and that fixed my problem. And I was like, I know we talked about a weird issue with authenticity tokens last week. So it was funny that that happened just yesterday. I, spring stop fixes everything. Which is yeah. why you should remove Spring from your gem file. <laughs> this is my soapbox. I've said this before. I had someone email me the other day who said that they listened to the show. And they're like, hey, man, I heard you talking about how you should remove Spring. And we removed Spring. And you're right, man. Life is so much better without Spring. Bootsnap makes it just as fast. Remove Spring. It's such a pain. Nate had something the other day. And I was like, wait, do you have Spring? Are you running uh you running spring here? He was like, Yeah. I was like, get rid of it. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that was part of the issue. <laughs> I don't hilarious. know. My tests run noticeably faster. They boot up noticeably faster when I still have spring in. So Yeah. Mine do well, too. Leave it in test mode then, not development. Yeah, that this is one of those things that like the free version of Jumpstart, I, I've like created, I don't know, a million Rails apps with that over the the years now. And and consistently what will happen is it will it will always run the Rails generator and then it will start adding gems and running the bundle install and whatever. And then it will get to a point where it's like generating device user or whatever. And it will just hang because of spring. So then it will just stop for like five minutes and I'll come back to the like terminal tab and be like, dang it, it's stuck here again. So I'll open up a new tab in the same folder and run spring stop and then it just continues from where it left off. But it might like leave out a file or something. But every single time that it freezes, it's because of spring. So I I was like, you know, I need to go to the readme and add like a disable spring environment variable before you run this command just to make sure that that doesn't happen because i know that it if it's happening for me it's going to happen for a lot of other people too and i'm sure that they're just like okay cancel and i guess retry it and see if it works it's so RF, start yeah. over yeah just delete your computer and <laughs> move on before we go andrew i wanted to talk to you about your new ruby meetup yeah, well, it was your idea. <laughs> Someone messaged uh, Chris and I on Twitter that they were listening to the show and they really liked your idea about a remote Ruby conference, but I'm pretty sure they specifically said, I don't think they specifically said conference, I th- think they said meetup, and which has kind of got my brain rolling. And I was like, well, I think Chris and I talked about it a little bit. I was like, you know, I would be interested in doing this but I was like, I will spend absolutely zero, zero brain cells will get pushed in this direction unless I can like absolutely 100% verify there is a, over, like I, I would say probably a hundred people who would be interested. Because if you have a hundred people who are interested, what, maybe 20 will end up actually doing it, which is like a decent amount. Well, that was my guess. I don't know. I wanted more than a hundred people to be interested. And I was thinking about this and I was like, well, just getting a hundred people to say they're interested is fine, but I wanted some sort of way to, you know, almost like confirm or quantify that. So I created a Mailchimp form to collect email addresses, and I was like, "All right, I will just use the Mailchimp landing page generator," and I didn't like it at all. So then I was like, "All right, well, I could spin this up in a Rails app, and have it on Heroku, and in less than thirty minutes." And then I was like, "That's kind of terrible, like to spin up a Rails app for a landing page to get email addresses." And I thought about it some more, and I was like, "You know what? I am going to, I'm going to use Gatsby." So, in a truly uncharacteristic fashion, I created a website that is ninety nine point four percent JavaScript, and had it got it online. It's uh, rubymeetup.online. It's basically just a landing page for you to 
submit your email address if you would be interested in doing some sort of online Ruby meetup, being a part of that, just to gauge interest. And I posted the link on Twitter and on the GoRail Slack, and in under a day had 50 people interested, which was cool. There's a few things on the site I want to tweak, and then I want to like do another round of posting it. But I think there is definitely enough interest, especially now that the coronavirus is doing its thing. And I think people are really, really interested in this idea, especially now that that's kind of ramped up. This is really like the perfect time to do a meetup or conference. And when I was thinking about your idea, I was like, that sounds like so much work. I'd rather just like get like a weekly or monthly recurring like group of people in a Zoom room and be like, hey, let's uh, get like someone to like present on a topic and kind of all just hang out. But yeah, uh, Gatsby, Netlify, Tailwind, UI. I have never spent less time on the UI and I think the site looks pretty good. Tailwind UI is your- super quick future site endeavors i use uh, jekyll tailwind starter and i like it because it's just essentially like i don't know i do a lot of marketing sites with it but i haven't every time i try to use gatsby i always give up so yeah i've built several things in gatsby i think this may be one of the only one sets no no there's a couple i really like gatsby I never really got into Jekyll because I think I, when I was starting to look into all of this, uh, Gatsby was really picking up steam and deploying it on Netlify is just so freaking easy. And then I got really into the whole headless CMS thing for a while. And it's just such a, a nice, not nice to write, but like there's a lot of community behind it. And it's really, it's, it's kind of nice. If you're not, like for me, like I don't write React. I don't understand React, but I can work with Gatsby and pretty pretty quickly. I enjoy it actually, which is something I don't think I would have expected myself to say a while ago. If I'm going to pick one, I typically reach for Gatsby. Cool. I'm still a, a Jekyll diehard. <laughs> but shame, uh, shame on you for using JavaScript for your Ruby meetup online. You know, it's true. It's <laughs> it true. Ah. It, this thing is, if you run the Chrome DevTools on this, this thing blazes, dude. And it's a progressive web app available offline, which is kind of pointless because it's literally only exists for an API call. But it, it's quick to get out of the box. I don't know. I've never used Jekyll. I saw a Jekyll site yesterday and I was like, I must have looked, I felt like an idiot five minutes later because I was like, what is this? It's just all... I didn't know it was Jekyll at first. I was like, there's no job. Where's all the JavaScript? I thought this was a static site. I don't see any JavaScript. All I see is markdown files. And then I finally saw the gem files. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, the the like structure of those Jekyll sites are like a little confusing sometimes because you're like, oh, how does this work? I contributed to Julian's building uh, betterstimulus.com, which is kind of like yeah. a group of little articles showing you like kind of giving you some good advice on how to use stimulus because it's kind of just out there is like here's stimulus here's what it does but how to use it correctly can be a little bit tricky so betterstimulus.com is pretty pretty awesome but he's got a, a Jekyll template that he's using it for some like Jekyll docs theme or something Which is cool, but then there's this like YAML front matter that determines the the titles and the sidebar and which one's the parent, and it's a little confusing. Like it's not that complex, but it's like duplicating stuff all over the place, and it it would just be easier if I could just throw stuff in a folder and have it figured out on its own. Yeah, shout out to Julian. He's the he hangs out in the Reflex group a lot, and. He's in Europe, so whenever I'm like coding at like three or four in the morning, like he's just waking up and he's like, "All right, so I see you're on again." <laughs> but he's been a lot of help. We've worked on some stuff together, contributed to each other's projects. So really smart guy. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, uh, I love that that project that he's working on, and he's got 
he was just showing me today a little teaser of the stimulus like Chrome DevTools plugin he's working on, which mm-hmm. is a cool idea given that the Vue and React ones are ones that you like almost can't live without. They're just so helpful. So stimulus will be a little bit different, I'm sure, but probably also pretty useful just in case you didn't name something right. Like my targets, I always forget to put the like controller name dot and the target name. I always forget the controller part of it. So those little things are probably like going to be really helpful to have in a Chrome dev tool. Yeah. Someone like posed the idea of that in the reflex discord, which I'll put a link to in the show notes. It's actually, there's a decent amount of people. Maybe, I don't know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like, active community discussion around stimulus and stimulus reflex in there. So but yeah, someone posed the idea of that and Nate was like, or someone was like, there was, this would be really cool to have in with stimulus. And Nate was like, I don't see why we couldn't do it. And then Julian started building it. So it's a cool little mind share. That's awesome. Well, I guess we should uh, direct people to rubymeetup.online to add their email address and then message us if they have ideas on you know, format or if they want to speak or something. I don't know. What do, what do you think? We, we need to probably get as much interest in, in an online roomie meetup as possible, but the, the hard part's probably going to be finding speakers, I would guess. See, I thought that would be the easy part, but who am I? Mm. I don't know. See, Jason's smiling, so now I'm really freaking out. <laughs> like I said, I'm putting no brain power to this until I get over 100 people on that list. Did you ever come to the remote Ruby meetups back in the day? I didn't even know they were a thing until you guys said they were. Yeah, so that's here. actually where the brand came from was remote Ruby was an online meetup. And yeah, it was like pulling teeth to find people to speak for me. Chris spoke the first one and then I spoke at the next like four and then I was like, well, it's too much work for me. So we just turned it into a podcast. Yeah. Well, that's why I wanted to get buy-in. And an email address I felt like was a decent enough thing. I felt like if you're going to put your email address into it, then you'd be... It, it, I would think that like that means you're actually interested and not just drive-by interested. Yeah. We, we totally had people show up. Like It was cool. There's definitely like a, a market for that. Like People want to come hang out. People just are less interested for some reason to talk, do an online presentation. Well, I have three right here. Nate's four. Can you I'll give me talk in your underwear? Uh, That'll be our promise. See, you're already doing yeah. better than than we were. So, Well, I, I've listened to y'all lament about it, and now I know where to steer. Well, cool. Well, good chat with you guys. And anything else before we go? I don't think so. Long live Ruby. See. <laughs> See Bye, guys. This podcast is brought to you by our friends at Linode. With 11 data centers worldwide, including their newest data center in Sydney, Australia, enterprise grade hardware, S3 compatible storage option, and their next generation network, Linode delivers the performance you expect at a price that you don't. Get started on Linode today by going to linode.com forward slash remote Ruby.